Welcome to everyone. This is Myron Chong from in, this is Myron from Israel, this uh, Today we believe that there is a significant growth in China's economy, and more active traders are interested in. <笑>你估我喺度做 webinar 其他人聽唔聽到啊 ？webinar 你估其他人聽唔聽到啊
Well, hello, Myron. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, well, uh, good morning from the U.S. and good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really early morning, right? Oh, it is. Uh, but it yeah. makes for an early day. I get to go home early <laughs> later on. <laughs> yes, That's I'm, good. I'm not in the office yet. Um, although, oh, okay. okay, I see um, your screen, but it's blank. Blank? Well, um, I already opened the slideshow for SGX and... Uh, okay, down. let me make sure because what I do, what I'm seeing is a um, is a blank screen here. Okay. 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 Uh, let's see. Have you shared your desktop? Ah, uh, not yet. Ah, uh, let me uh, see. Where I? Okay. Uh, the control panel on the right side. Uh huh. Uh, you'll see a sharing uh, menu bar. Sharing menu bar. Ah, now I see it. <laughs> okay, now I see. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's good. Okay. okay. Um, now, would you uh, move the slide, uh, move it to the next, to the disclosures? Okay. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. I want. Oh, now I saw it. Okay, so there's about. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't bad. Oh, it's working much better than it did with Tarek, Tarek the <laughs> other day. Um, yeah. And I think the difference is because you um, you're running it from Hong Kong. It was uh, too yeah, far maybe. when I was running it from the U.S. So uh, uh -huh. much better. Okay. Now I do. Let me. Oh. I'm going to put this. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Oh, there. Now I have it, and I have it full screen. Excellent. Okay, okay would you uh, take it back to the first slide? Okay. Uh, if you, um, do you have, here you go. Okay, beautiful. And it came right up. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, um, <clears throat> now um, what I want you to do is not um, pass me the control, but go ahead and right-click on my name. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in the control panel, and you see uh -huh. there, you can make um, uh, make me the presenter. I don't want to be the presenter. Um, oh. But that's how you'll. I just want to remind you that's when Tarek um, joins. That's how you'll okay. uh, yeah. pass the controls to yeah. him. Um, mm -hmm. We'll make sure that his screen is uh, is in full screen. Now, mm -hmm. um, let me see. We do not want to start the broadcast until until you're ready to begin. So just mm -hmm. quickly, the steps to take. Um, we, we've got the broadcast going now, which allows us to talk, and no one in the session, we already have an attendee. That's amazing. <laughs> Someone's already <laughs> very excited. I see one attendee here, right? Yes. Uh, you see the attendee um, uh, panel? Is it There's two. Oh, the organizer. Oh, okay. No worries. Just okay. go ahead, please. Oh, Yeah. Okay, because the, now uh, there's an attendees tab and then there's staff. So you go to the staff tab in the attendees panel, and that's where you'll, when Tarek joins, that's where you'll be able yeah. to pass the yeah. controls to him. Um, oh, uh, would you stop the recording? Okay. So I need to show the disclosure page, right? Yes, but stop the recording now. Um, oh, okay. you hit start recording, and we don't want to record this part. All right, so um, you'll start the recording later on. Ah, there we oh, go. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, we can't um, we can't adjust the recording at all. So you want to start the recording oh, okay. as the session begins. But if I start the recording, I need to start the broadcast. Right. Well, okay. So, um, we'll start the broadcast first. Um, uh, 
And you've got Tarek's bio shit going. All right. Okay. Um, is everyone ready? We're set. I'm ready. Okay, that's good. So, um, welcome to everyone. This is Myron from Interactive Brokers, and then we are pleasure to have a webinar in conjunction with uh, SGX today. And the topic for today is uh, trading strategies on Greater China through SGX listed futures contracts. And Terry Sanderson is a CFP and running investment portfolios for individual and institutional clubs at GFM Asset Management in Hong Kong. And he has more than 15 year experiences in capital markets and like global stock, bond, currency, and commodity. And he also holds a master in financial engineer and graduated from University of California. And he also a lecturer for fixed income and alternative investments at Asset Business School in Singapore. So we are happy to, for Tarek to join our seminar uh, webinar today. And if you have a, any questions related to our webinar today, please feel free to raise your questions over the chat. And Tarek will answer your questions at the end of the webinars. Uh, Tarek, are you with us now? Excellent. Yes, I'm here. Okay, then uh, let's start now. Thank you. Well, oh, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, to be presenting uh, my view on basically how I. Oops, I'll show my screen. And I've got my screen. Can everyone can everyone see the main slide right now with GFM Asset Management SGX on the title slide? Looks so, good. Excellent. Good. Well, um, thanks again to Interactive Brokers and SGX uh, for having me. As mentioned, I'm an independent asset manager, and I'm going to be presenting my experience and my views on how I specifically use the SGX listed futures contracts in order to trade the greater China markets. Uh, we're mostly going to be talking today about equity and currency markets. Um, the background here was an old World War II slide really describing the many different parts of greater China. Since as I'm going to be describing in a bit, there's a lot more to, to China than one country, as it's often described. So first and foremost, I want to present two disclaimers. First of all, on this slide, we have our disclaimer, GFM's disclaimer. And now we have another disclaimer by the Singapore Exchange and SGX. Okay, good. Now that we have the disclaimers about, out of the way, I just want to give a, a bit more of an introduction uh, to, um, to myself. As the presenter mentioned, my name is Tarek Dennison. I'm a certified financial planner in Hong Kong and Macau by the uh, IFP uh, HK. I am one of the advisors on the Interactive Brokers Marketplace. So I manage clients' accounts on Interactive Brokers, all the separately managed accounts. And I run this through two entities. Basically, our US-based clients are run through our um, US-based account, GFM Asset Management LLC. And we have a, a Hong Kong SFC licensed Type 9 asset management firm, GFM Group Limited, uh, both run, uh, run here out of Hong Kong, but for two different client bases. As mentioned, I have 15 years experience in different capital markets. I started my career with Commerce Bank in New York and then had most of my career at Bear Stearns right up until the day that it collapsed. Uh, Bear Stearns was then taken over by JP Morgan. After that, I moved uh, out here to Hong Kong with uh, CIBC, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, and then spent some time at SoftGen before starting my own asset management firm. I have a master's in financial engineering from the University of California, and I'm also an avid teacher and lecturer of uh, finance, both at Ethic Business School in Singapore, the CFA Society, and uh, several other institutions in the region. I'm an avid speaker, writer, and traveler. So first of all, I often start these, uh, these presentations with some of the most obvious questions. Believe it or not, there are still several times I will go to the US and speak to investors there, where the first topic I often have to present, at, I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, is where is China? But I am sometimes having to explain uh, where exactly is Hong Kong? What is Hong Kong a part of? Is Hong Kong a part of China? What is Macau? How far is Macau from Hong Kong? I just brought up the quick Wikipedia map showing what is greater China. Generally, when we talk about greater China, we're talking about the People's Republic of China, which here in Hong Kong we call mainland China, but we're also including Hong Kong and Macau and Taiwan. And one of the reasons we use the term greater China is to avoid any political dispute or political debate on what the political status of Taiwan is. Um, as I'll be showing later, uh, Taiwan, 
uh, the PRC and Hong Kong all have uh, their own major stock markets, each with over a thousand listed companies. Macau, on the other hand, is a, is a relatively small entity, mostly known for gambling. There are nine listed uh, companies in Hong Kong which are based in Macau, but Macau, Macau itself doesn't really have its own capital market. The remarkable story in terms of thinking of why do we care about China? Why should we pay attention to China? Why should we bother Chinese stocks? Uh, one of the many charts you could use to show that is just what has happened to China? What has China done over the past 30 years that's so remarkable? And what this chart shows is it shows what the percentage of the global GDP, the percentage of the global economy, was made up by each of the top 10 countries over the past 32 years, well, actually over the past 17 years and projected over the next five years. So from 1980 to the year 2022. Uh, you'll notice all the way back at the beginning in 1980, China was a tiny part of the world economy, despite already having the largest population uh, of any of the top 10 markets. And then over the past 30 years, uh, its economy came to be larger on a purchasing power parity basis than even the U.S. economy. Um, and compared to any of the other top 10 countries, this was truly a remarkable feat. Now, the third largest one here, so above the green United States, uh, don't be confused by the indicator on the side. That's actually India. So it is remarkable that India has actually doubled in its share of the global economy, but it's still not quite as remarkable as China, which has gone from being about 3% of the world economy to 20% of the world economy. So that's the, that's the first question of why should we pay attention to greater China to begin with. Uh, now, just as important uh, for those with a China focus and focused on this part of the world was how much uh, specifically the People's Republic of China has become an even larger and larger share of greater China. Um, may be easy enough to believe, but back in 1980, uh, the PRC itself was less than three quarters of the whole of the greater China economy. Uh, Hong Kong's economy and Taiwan's economy were much, much larger on a per capita basis, were relatively large even on an overall basis, and certainly were far more accessible to uh, Western investors. Um, so even within greater China, the story that we've seen over the past 30 years has been much more one of mainland China, all about mainland China, and Hong Kong and Taiwan being a relatively smaller portion. Although that said, anyone who's followed the Hang Seng Index and Hong Kong property market knows that we've had uh, quite strong investment returns even here in Hong Kong as well. A lot of that due to obviously trade coming through China doesn't appear uh, necessarily in our GDP, but very much affects uh, our economy and our market. Now some statistics just explaining what's the difference between uh, stocks listed in Hong Kong, uh, stocks listed in uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen. So um, on interactive brokers, uh, unfortunately we don't have access to trading uh, Taipei listed stocks. But we now, thanks to Stock Connect, can trade not only the Hong Kong listed stocks on the left side of the slide, but we can also trade many of the Shanghai and Shenzhen listed stocks on the right uh, side of the slide. I believe the uh, Stock Connect now has about over 500 Shanghai stocks eligible for northbound trading. Shenzhen Stock Connect has over 1,000 stocks eligible for northbound trading. Each of the markets, as you can see, has over 1,000 listed companies on the main board in Hong Kong, the Shanghai A-share market, and the, Shanghai A and the Shenzhen A-share market. Each one also has a smaller, what you call my, might call minor market. There's the gem board in Hong Kong, which is the growth and emerging market companies, uh, perhaps what you might consider an equivalent of a pink sheets or OTC bulletin board in the United States. Uh, and then there's also the, Shanghai, the B share markets, both in Shanghai and Shenzhen. Now the B share markets were originally a separate share class made specifically for foreign investors. Shanghai B shares are traded in US dollars and meant for foreign investors, while Shenzhen B shares are traded in Shenzhen in Hong Kong dollars and uh, intended for foreign investors. But you can see by the number of issues that the B share market is becoming a far less important way that foreigners access the Chinese stock market because now we can access Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong as well as trade A shares directly through uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. You can also see by the relative size of the markets each one of the markets alone is, is on the order of 30 billion Hong Kong dollars and 30 billion renminbi. That's about 4 billion U.S. dollars, uh, I'm sorry, 4 trillion U.S. dollars in market cap for each of those markets. There's also a difference in terms of valuation. Here in Hong Kong, our valuations are actually cheaper than um, an index like the S&P 500. Our valuations here are relatively attractive. Um, Shanghai A shares are slightly more expensive due to a premium that we're going to be discussing later. And then the Shenzhen Stock Exchange trades at a fairly high, fairly expensive 35 times earnings, 
mainly because these are different private companies, often uh, high-flying tech companies there. So now I want to describe a little bit of the background and a little bit of the difference between why you have this A-share market and H-share market. If you want to trade Chinese companies, very often if you're going to trade a major China ETF listed in the U.S., for example, or one of the main China futures, those are very often H-shares. These are Hong Kong-listed companies, uh, Hong Kong-listed Chinese companies, as opposed to the A-shares, which trade in mainland China. So the A-shares traded in Shanghai and Shenzhen are denominated in renminbi, and originally they were restricted only to mainland local investors. So you had to be a PRC citizen based in the PRC with onshore money in order to trade them. That opened up to uh, QFEs, which stands for Qualified Foreign Institutional Investors in 2002, uh, with Morgan Stanley, the UBS, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation being some of the original QFEs uh, investing in the onshore market. It then became open to a wide, larger foreign investor base through the Hong Kong Stock Exchange Stock Connect program. The Stock Connect basically allowed anyone with access to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to trade over 500 Shanghai-listed A shares just as though they were listed in Hong Kong. It has a full closed loop system, which basically makes sure that conversion of renminbi, ownership of the A shares, all happens in a closed loop and that, that it's not used to actually transfer money uh, across the border. Uh, Interactive Brokers was fairly quick to get on board with this, and I was actually able to trade A shares on, on my Interactive Brokers accounts before even many of my competitors at the large banks were able to. Um, in 2016, Stock Connect also opened uh, to Shenzhen, although there was far less attention uh, paid to that at that point, partly for reason of the premium that I will also be explaining later. Um, now, as I was mentioning the premium, there are many companies which have both A shares and H shares, and on average, the A shares listed in mainland China have traded at a 15 to 40% premium to the exact same companies listed in Hong Kong. And I'll show a chart of this premium index later. Now, what's the difference between A shares and H shares, red chips, and T chips? Uh, H shares, as mentioned, are basically, Hong Kong, uh, basically Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong, while you have red chips and P chips, uh, which are also effectively Chinese companies, but they differ based on where they're incorporated. So let's say, for example, if uh, Alibaba were listed in Hong Kong, it would be a P-chip because it's actually a, um, it's a Cayman Islands uh, domiciled or Cayman Islands incorporated company, which effectively has participation in a Chinese, a mainland Chinese business. Uh, 25 of uh, H shares only make up about 25% of, of the Hong Kong listed names, so about 400 of the uh, 1,700 Hong Kong listed stocks but they are much, much larger companies. They make up about 65% of Hong Kong's market cap. And you can probably guess what some of these large names are. These are China Construction Bank, ICBC, Sinopec, very large uh, Chinese companies compared to a lot of local Hong Kong companies, which are just not as big. Uh, mainland investors uh, were originally able to invest in uh, Hong Kong listed companies through a mirror of the QFI program, which was called QDII that's Qualified Domestic Institutional Investor, which uh, basically is a program for mainland investors to convert renminbi into Hong Kong dollars or US dollars to invest in overseas markets. That also was a very controlled system, and then that expanded uh, through Stock Connect as well. Stock Connect is a two-way system where when you hear about southbound trading, trading, that's mainland investors based in mainland China trading Hong Kong listed stocks uh, through the Shanghai or Shenzhen exchange, while northbound trading is foreign investors trading through Hong Kong to access mainland markets. Now, I mentioned earlier the, um, the premium of A share of Chinese A shares over Chinese H shares, uh, and this is one of the indices used to track this. So this is the Hang Seng China AH Premium Index. It's a weighted index published by Hang Seng, uh, which shows what is the average premium between uh, the same company. So let's say, for example, we have China Construction Bank, they have A shares listed in Shanghai and H shares listed in Hong Kong. And if the H share in Hong Kong is, is trading at 100 uh, Hong Kong dollars, but the A share traded in Shanghai is at 105 renminbi, which would be the equivalent of 120 Hong Kong dollars, we say that the A share premium for that name is 20%. And that premium weighted on an average um, as of this snapshot about a month ago was uh, what at 126, so a 26% premium of A shares over H shares. 
If you look back on the chart right around the end of 2014, you'll notice that was the sudden shock between when the A shares went from a discount to a premium. And that was right around the timing of Stock Connect. Uh, before Stock Connect op opened, there was a lot of uncertainty about whether it would go through, about how widely it would be used, and so forth. So obviously, if you were one of the early adopters able to buy the A shares at a discount and sell them at a premium, you benefited from that. Uh, but then you probably remember in the middle of 2015, there was a, uh, there was a crash in A shares in China, and there's been a lot of volatility devaluation since then. Only in 2017 have we started seeing the China market pick up again and um, the premium settling at that healthy 20% plus level. Um, now, the A share premium index is one thing to look at as a whole. I find it just as important to look at on a name by name basis because when you have access to, to single stock or through Stock Connect, uh, you want to see which, which are the, in which case would you like to buy the A share, which case would you like to buy the A share. Now, this is from a website called AA Stocks. And you'll notice up top there's a pie chart showing uh, which companies have the H shares trading at a discount to the A shares and which companies have the H shares trading at a premium to the A shares. And you'll notice in this case there are only three companies where the A share is at a discount to the H share. Uh, and it's a very narrow discount of 0 to 10%. While most of them are trading at a premium, 77 on this watch list are trading at a premium of 20% or more. Uh, the con, so you'll notice a blue and white icon next to each individual symbol in the second column. That means that the name is on Stock Connect and that you can trade both of the stocks, either the A share or the H share through Stock Connect. And on the right, you'll notice some of these names have a premium of 63%, 70%, while only Jiangsu Express uh, has, it, has the A share trading at a discount to the H share. So this is just one way that you can break that down and look on a name by name basis, which names are trading at a premium, which names are trading at a discount. Um, so looking at the indices in a little more detail, uh, when we start talking about uh, the SGX listed futures, uh, the main futures contract which still trades in Singapore on the uh, China indices is the FTSE Xinhua China A50 index. This is really the main way offshore investors have been able to trade uh, a China A share index through, a, through an offshore listed futures contract. Uh, there are also ETFs and other ways of tracking this index. So this is one of the, the main offshore uh, A share indi indices that are followed. Onshore, there's another index called the CSI 300. But if you're an offshore investor trading the SGX listed futures, this is your, this is your contract. What I want to show on this slide is that this, in this, this index is really dominated by banks, specifically the big Chinese banks. In fact, if you look at the top 10 components here, uh, I mean, I should say financials more specifically, the number one listed component is Ping On Insurance Group, so it's an insurance company. And you have China Merchants Bank, uh, ICBC, Shanghai Pudong, China Minsheng, Citic Securities, ABC, Bank of Communications. Um, these are these make up over 62% of the entire index by weight. And then you have a few other Shanghai listed companies such as Guizhou Maotai, which makes those very high alcoholic uh, spirits served at banquets. Um, but one thing to keep in mind when trading the A50 index is it's primarily an index of Chinese banks, uh, which may or may not be a, a bad thing or a good thing depending on your view on, of uh, Chinese banks in the, uh, in the overall market. Um, oh, I also wanted to show down here at the bottom, I wanted to show the relative volume and the relative uh, size and role of each of these futures contracts. So these contracts do roll monthly, and um, it, it is, I believe, uh, and uh, Cecilia can correct me on this, one of the most liquid futures contracts traded on the SGX, even more liquid than the Nikkei or the Straits Times futures. So by contrast, we wanted to contrast the FTSE Xinhua A50 index, the A50 futures, with the MSCI China futures. Uh, first of all, if you gaze down at the bottom, you'll notice that the SGX MSCI China futures are far less liquid. They're not trading quite as much yet. And part of the reason is because MSCI China is, a, um, is an offshore index. It's basically an H share plus what you might call an N share index. So these are Chinese companies listed either in Hong Kong or New York. So if you look at the, the top few components, there's uh, Tencent, Alibaba. Alibaba is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It's not listed in Hong Kong. Tencent is listed in Hong Kong. These are basically, um, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent are China's answer to the U.S.'s FANG stocks. So Baidu is very often thought of as the Chinese Google. Alibaba is the Chinese Amazon. 
Tencent is thought of as the um, as the Chinese Facebook. Um, and so you can see just by looking both at the top components as well as what types of companies these are, this is a very, very different index. It's 38% IT as opposed to over 60% financials. But one of the main reasons is this probably doesn't trade quite as much. It's not because there's less interest in these offshore markets. It's because you can already trade to the H shares through uh, H key X-listed futures, uh, or you can trade them through ETFs, which were um, the much longer uh, lasting way of trading, uh, trading this index. Uh, the third index I want to talk about, which, was, which is increasingly becoming maybe the forgotten part of Greater China, is the MSCI Taiwan Index. So Taiwan is still a, an important part of Greater China. It's still a different market. Um, it has a different structure and in many ways is a different economy than the rest of Greater China. Um, although, as we'll see later, that uh, the overall stock index is highly correlated with the rest of the, of the Chinese index. You'll notice here it's, 50, it's a 57% IT index, but it's, these companies are very different companies than the companies that make up the MSCI China free index. So you don't have the equivalent of a BAT or a FANG stocks, internet companies which are going to scale and take over the world. Instead what you have are you have these kind of old school 70s and 80s era um, electronics manufacturing type of companies and precision manufacturing uh, companies making up a large, um, a large percentage of the index. Now, as mentioned, uh, unfortunately on Interactive Brokers, uh, at least I haven't been able to trade Taiwan listed stocks, uh, but you can trade the MSCI Taiwan futures both on the SGX or you can trade MSCI Taiwan through a US listed e uh, ETF, obviously with advantages and disadvantages for liquidity and tax. You'll notice that the volume of this contract is about 22,000, so it's far more li liquid than the MSCI China SGX contract, but not as liquid as the A50 contract. Um, this chart just shows a quick snapshot of performance over the past year of the, of the three relative inde indices. Now this is tracked by the three U.S. listed ETFs. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a good roll chart of how the uh, futures would have performed rolling uh, over the period. But the blue line is the uh, A50 uh, index uh, tracked by the A50 ETF uh, in the U.S. Um, the, uh, MCHI is the ETF tracking the MSCI China index, and EWT is the uh, ETF tracking um, uh, MSCI Taiwan. So you'll notice that the three are highly correlated with e highly correlated with each other, but not not exactly the same. And in fact, Taiwan, understandably, has largely been the laggard, um, uh, had largely been the laggard in many ways, and the A50 has been the most volatile. Now on to futures contracts. Uh, I think the main the main subject of this uh, webinar was supposed to be talking about how do we use futures contracts specifically to, to trade and access these markets. And I wanted to list the six that I regularly watch and trade that are SGX listed and traded on the, um, uh, on the interactive brokers platform. Uh, now the top one of course is not a, uh, is not a greater China future, but it's, uh, it's nonetheless one of the longest lasting SGX futures that I list here for reference. It's the SGX Nikkei futures contract. This is the one that Nick Leeson probably made quite famous back in the mid 1990s. Uh, and you'll notice here that it's not quite, it doesn't trade quite as many contracts as the, uh, as the A50 uh, futures. But one thing to keep in mind though is that the contract size on the A50 futures is quite a bit smaller. Each of the units on the A50 futures is one US dollar. Well, on the uh, SGX Nikkei, I believe the unit is uh, 500 yen. Um, and then the next unit is the, um, the MSCI Taiwan, the, uh, the STW, the SGX Taiwan futures, followed by the MSCI China Free, which unfortunately I wasn't able to get any volume numbers on. And then the last two contracts are contracts on the renminbi. One is the price of uh, renminbi in US dollars, and that's for dollar settlement. And the second one is an offshore renminbi, it's the price of 100,000 US dollars in, in RIN and B. And as, a, as I've seen, that tends to be the more liquid contract and the one that competes with the HKEX listed RIN and B futures contract. So just a quick screenshot that you're probably gonna see whenever you try and trade one of these futures contracts in an account. Um, I just took screenshots of each of the three here, uh, both the uh, A50, the MSCI Taiwan, and the MSCI uh, China Free to show roughly what the contract size would be. Okay, if you wanted to, let's say, buy one lot of the MSCI China Free P50 
futures contract that would give you uh, exposure to roughly 41,740 or call it 40 to 50 thousand dollars worth of the index. So it's an index multiplier, five U.S. dollars per point. It is a U.S. dollar denominated contract, uh, like both the MSCI Taiwan and the A50. So you do not directly get access to any any renminbi B risk. Rather, what you have is you have a dollar settlement against uh, against an index that's calculated by um, MSCI. And of course, for contracts, uh, contract specs, margin requirements, and so forth, that's all on the um, SGX website or on the uh, Interactive Brokers trading screen. Um, the renminbi futures contracts trade similarly to any other futures, but the one important thing to keep in mind is that on the upper left, I've got the onshore Chinese renminbi settled in U.S. dollars. That is the price of um, a lot of renminbi. I believe it's 500,000 renminbi in U.S. dollars. So you'll notice the size there is about 81,495 U.S. dollars at that time, uh, compared with the other one being the price of 100,000 U.S. dollars in offshore renminbi and can actually settle in offshore renminbi. So, to, so just to be clear, if you wanted to get the same exposure to renminbi, you would buy one contract, but you would sell the other contract. And if I have time at the end, I'll, I can show one example of how we use these renminbi contracts either to synthetically create a dim sum bond using a U.S. dollar bond or to take a dim sum bond and hedge out the currency risk and, uh, and basically swap out only the credit risk. So all of that can be done uh, with these uh, with these listed futures contracts. Now, I'm going to discuss a few different trade ideas, uh, and these are trades that I've done in various flavors over the years using different positions on futures contracts or sometimes other cash instruments. So the first one, trade number one, is to go long the MSCI free index and short the A50 futures. Now, obviously, you could do this, do this the other way too, but just to describe one example of what would be the, tr the drivers of this particular trade idea or this type of trade. The reason for this would be the drivers would be a narrowing of the AH premium. You looked at the chart earlier and you saw that uh, A shares were trading at a 26% premium to, to H shares. You believe that this premium was in some way going to collapse. You didn't know whether or not the, um, the overall China market was going to go up or down. But if that spread were to narrow, if the AH premium were to narrow, being long H shares and short A shares uh, would, would capture a profit. Uh, another driver which is unrelated to the AH premium is continued strength in the BAT stocks, uh, not necessarily versus the FANG stocks, but it's BAT stocks versus Chinese banks. Um, one important thing again to remember is that Baidu and Alibaba are traded in New York, so they don't have corresponding A shares, they're not part of the AH premium, so it's a different driver on why you, why you do a long index that, that holds those versus short the A50 futures. Now what are the risks of doing this trade? Well, most obviously, uh, the AH premium itself is fairly volatile. It's not entirely rational. Uh, even though we all think it should narrow, there's no reason why it should be at 26% plus, it very easily could go to a 40% premium. And that's, that's the risk that you face if you were to do this long short trade. Uh, and then on the flip side too, there could be an absolute collapse in that. You could imagine a scenario where uh, China was to have, have the equivalent of a 2000 style uh, tech bubble burst where you know, the NASDAQ in the U.S. went from 5,000 to 1,500, and if that were to have a similar collapse, even if the rest of the H shares uh, didn't suffer as much, this trade would definitely suffer. Um, now, when we look at the uh, components sector by sector, uh, one of the things that we wanted to look at is the A50. How does the A50 compare with the MSCI China Free versus the other major H share index, which is traded, the Hang, the Hang Seng H share index? So for many years of my career, when we offered uh, clients China exposure, usually we were offering them pure H-share exposure. And this was often traded through the uh, Hang Seng China Enterprises Index, say Hang Seng Index. And the futures trade here in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Exchange, they're very, very liquid. So if we wanted to, to, to compare that, that liquid H-share index with one of the uh, SGX listed index, would it look more like the A50 index or would it more look, look more like the MSCI China Free? Intuitively, we might think it looks more like the China Free because they are H shares, but what I'm showing here is a sector profile, showing that the H share index, like the A share index, is also dominated by financials, so insurance companies and banks, with far less exposure to IT and consumer companies than you would see um, in, uh, in either the A or the H share indices. So, trade idea number two. 
uh, in this case, I say I use SC as a short uh, shortcut, but what I mean here is long small cap stocks. So let's say you've got a portfolio of individual small companies, individual off index companies that you've picked. Either you believe they have good fundamentals, good reason to outperform uh, the broader market. Uh, so you buy these names in, in the cash market, uh, most likely through Stock Connect. Uh, and you hedge by shorting the, the, the A50 futures. This is really very little different than in a trade I'm going to be describing, let's say, in my next seminar in Japan, where you can buy Japanese stocks and short Nikkei futures, or in the U.S. by buying U.S. small caps and shorting S&P futures. Uh, here, the alpha is very much generated by selecting the right portfolio of individual names. You also have the option to do discount, ro discount rotation rather than just relying on the AH premium as you did with the last trade. So for example, you can buy the names that are most deeply discounted, and when you sell the A50 futures, you're going to capture the, capture the, end, the entire premium. Uh, I should mention at this point, when I talk about shorting A50 futures, a big use of the A50 futures uh, obviously was for uh, offshore investors to be able to short um, uh, an A-share index without, first of all, with access, and then second of all, without risk of uh, China suddenly coming in and clamping down, putting in short selling restrictions and other things like that. So one of the things to keep in mind if you're to do this, you obviously need, a ca you need cash to fund your long stock position. It's not the same as just meeting the margin requirement on your futures contract. You also have USD CNH, CNH basis risk. By this I mean the, uh, the cash stocks that you buy are going to be denominated in RIN and B, and you're going to be exposed to the rise and fall of the RIN and B in a way that you will not when you short the US dollars nominated A50, A50 futures contract. So one of the biggest risks you have there is that there's a total RIN-D crash, RIN-D credit crisis. Uh, somehow that doesn't affect the value of stocks in rin and So the value of your stocks doesn't change in rin and The A50 index doesn't change, but you would have lost that value in terms of the dollar value of your stock portfolio. That would be one basis risk you'd face in this trade. Also, you would, be, you would have a risk of a margin call if the AH premium ri uh, widens or if your shares underperform uh, the A50 index. So that, that was the, uh, the cash long short trade. Uh, the third trade idea would be to short the MSCI Taiwan index versus a long, uh, versus a long a combination of either the MSCI China, the A50, or a combination of the two. This is basically an integrator China trade where basically you're pitting one part of Greater China against the other on, on a macro level. We've already talked earlier about how uh, they're really quite different markets and quite different indices in terms of the companies that make them up, and also how Taiwan has been certainly a much slower grower than the rest of Greater China. Now, one thing I, sh I should mention from my, my previous tra trade idea on selecting individual companies, I don't always believe growth is the, is the best driver of returns. But if you believe that the overall returns, if you believe Chi Taiwan is going to continue to be a lagger uh, compared to the rest of the China markets, whether it's the BAT companies or A-share banks that are funding mainland growth, this would be one driver to think that the rest of Greater China is going to outperform MSCI Taiwan. Uh, the other attractive thing about this trade is that all of these contracts are U.S. dollar denominated. So in theory, your, um, your currency risk is offset. Of course, there, there could be correlation between uh, currency and performance of each of the respective indices. Now, what's the, uh, what are the risks in this trade? One is that you can have a major onshore credit crisis where Taiwan is less affected. Uh, we're often hearing about how much debt exists on, on, on onshore, both in Chinese banks and in the shadow banking system. Um, Taiwan has been a, a much more mature market in many ways, even though it's less accessible. It's quite possible that, uh, that you might see a divergence there. Okay, so it looks like it looks like my slides have crashed right here. I don't know if we can bring up I don't know if we can bring up uh, another set of slides to back up. Hello, is anybody there? Hi, Tarek. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if we can get. Um, now, I do see some slides. I believe these may be slides. Uh, Myron may be bringing up the slides. I'm just trying to open it up again on my side to see if there's any time. Here right now? Okay.
Okay. Can I uh, can I take uh, control here again? Do you need the uh, 23 yeah. slides? I can, I, can, I, can, I can try loading my slides again on this side. I, I restarted PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Looks like you do have control, Tarek. So if you can put okay. that into full screen. Okay. You hear again? Okay. Okay, looks like it's caught me here this time. Myron, do you have yeah. the slides open on your yeah. desktop? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's um, let's make you the presenter, and um, if you can take that, I believe Tarek, you were on slide 22. Okay, 22. Um, okay. Right, so uh, we'll make you the presenter, Myron, and if you can pass the slides along uh, for Tarek, I think that will work. Okay. okay, excellent, thanks. Good that we have that back up. 22, right? Uh, yeah, I was actually just finishing up slide number 22, talking about the uh, okay. long MSCI, yeah, the, the um, yeah. So uh, that was the, um, that was trade ID number number three. That was uh, long China, short Taiwan, and then the last, fi the final trade, which is one that I often uh, present in many of my educational workshops on dim sum bonds and fixed income and so forth like that, is how to use these futures contracts to create synthetic uh, dim sum bonds. Um, let's say, for example, you wanted renminbi denominated bonds. You like the three to four percent yield they provide, but you either couldn't get the bonds, you don't have a credit that you like. Um, uh, the, how do you synthesize basically a, a renminbi yield or renminbi exposure as you would with a dim sum bond? And I often say you can buy either a U.S. Treasury or you can either buy another U.S. dollar credit, uh, U.S. dollar credit that you like. If you were really aggressive, you could, for example, say buy Country Garden, um, and then you could trade renminbi futures. And I could do, there's we put buying either the CY futures or selling the UC futures. What that effectively does is it uh, is it um, locks in a forward rate for your renminbi. And so uh, you would turn what would effectively be a 1% yield in US dollar bonds into a 3 to 4% yield in, in renminbi. Uh, so this is, works almost exactly like a currency swap would, only you're limited to whatever the tenor is, whatever uh, term you can trade on, on a liquid um, currency futures. And I do show several spreadsheets often showing how this works where even if you did this on a two or three year bond and you kept rolling this on a quarterly basis, you still effectively get the same yield pickup if you were to take a US dollar bond and uh, hedge it using the currency futures. Now, you could also do this trade exactly in reverse, where let's say, for example, you had a dim sum bond you like, a certain dim sum credit, but you were bearish on the, uh, on the currency, you were bearish on the Chinese currency. You could buy the renminbi bond and you could either sell the CY futures contract or buy the UC futures contract and what that would do, it would hedge out the renminbi risk while letting you lock in the credit spread. Um, so the drivers in the first case is that if you believe there's going to be RMB strength and you wanted to get currency exposure and the higher yield, the second one is if you like the onshore credit that you were worried about the, the, uh, the currency risk. So those are my examples of uh, four different trades um, and uh, basically four different ways that I have and, uh, and may continue to use the SGX listed futures to access China markets. Um, if we could go to the final slide, it'll show you my contact information. Um, and, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time, uh, as well as any that you'd like to, uh, like to shoot at me and, and contact, contact me later. Okay, so just as a start here, I have one question talking about uh, how do I handle the, the quanto risk between the U.S. dollar denominated A50 futures contract uh, versus the uh, obviously the, the renminbi denominated um, uh, stock connect A shares. So I'm, I briefly mentioned that earlier in one of my slides when I talked about this is currently one of my favorite trades. I buy a portfolio of A shares uh, through Stock Connect, 
but then I, uh, I would hedge by selling A50 futures, which are U.S. dollar denominated. Now, as mentioned, what, one, of, one of my biggest, biggest risks in this case would be that the uh, renminbi were to suddenly devalue. If, let's say, it were overnight to go from 6.5 to 13, and the index were, the index were not to move, then, uh, then I would be left with a large loss. I, my cash portfolio would be worth 50% as much, whereas my, uh, my hedge wouldn't have pro provided me anything. So in theory, if I wanted to purely hedge that, I wanted to hedge against that risk, then what I could do is I could just overlay a second position on, on the renminbi uh, futures contracts. So basically I would do the opposite position of what I talked about in slide 23. So I would do the same trade I did in um, slide number 21, which is going long uh, stock connect stocks and short A50 futures. And then I would either sell the CY contract or buy the, buy the UC contract. Now, there's a reason why we don't put those trades on all the time. That would cost about 3% a year, basically the interest rate difference between renminbi interest rates and dollar interest rates. But if you are genuinely worried that the, um, uh, that the renminbi, or if you believe that the renminbi is going to collapse, there's no more direct hedge than just simply putting on the currency hedge. So that was the, uh, that was the first question. Second, well, uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Tarek. Do you see another question? Yeah, uh, just one more question here. There was, uh, what is the difference between Stock Connect and RQC? Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier QC, which is qualified for in institutional investors, and then there's also a program uh, uh, asked in this question about RQC. That's the Rinman B Qualified for an Institutional Investors Program. That's a uh, separate form of QC that was started, uh, I believe, around 2010, 2011, mostly used to access the interbank bond market. Um, now, so you, if you'll notice, many of the ETFs that access onshore China bonds, they haven't been terribly popular, but those were there mostly through the, R, the RQC program. And my question, obviously, uh, for this is why, um, why we haven't seen offshore bond futures or, or a greater futures market developing in, in the China bond market. I believe obviously there's a chicken egg problem there. Once you see greater interest in the bond market, you'll see uh, you'll see greater flow to the futures there. Got one more question here. Um, so, dear Tarek, how do you think the upcoming Chinese Congress meeting will impact will impact the A50 futures? Um, so this is more of a view on uh, on overall ch uh, Chinese politics and, uh, and on the on the uh, um, uh, on, the, on the overall effect of the Chinese, Chinese market. I actually have to admit, I'm not a Chinese political pundit or a Chinese, uh, Chinese macroeconomist. I don't believe that the, current, the Chinese markets are currently pricing in very much uncertainty. So uh, one, th one thing I would, I would say probably with a fair degree of confidence, I don't think it's going to make that much difference unless there's, a, there's something said at the conference which surprises a lot of people. And my experience uh, with everything that the Ch these uh, Chinese Congress meetings have done. They've done everything fairly gradually, and usually uh, events that would affect the A50 futures markets are surprise un unplanned, uh, unplanned events like the intervention in the 2015 crash. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure how well, uh, how well that, answer, that answered your, your question, but I think first of all you were going to say how does it affect the index, and then second of all how does it affect the futures. Uh, I think I noticed another question from you later. First, let me get to question number two. Um, question, uh, next question here. What do you think is pushing the AH premium at its current level of, of 20, 25%? Well, I thought I knew back in uh, 2014 when I first saw the AH premium uh, getting, getting pushed up. The general story is that the A share market is driven largely by onshore retail investors who, even though they now have access to the H-share market through Stock Connect, still largely pay attention to the A-share market and trade through the A-share market because it's what they know and what they can most easily access. Uh, we've every now and then seen stories like once every six months, an article will come on a mainland Chinese paper that, um, 
lets investors in mainland China know about the discounts of the same companies trading in Hong Kong, and then suddenly you'll see a, a brief contracting in the AH premium as mainland investors will sell their A shares and then buy the A shares on Stock Connect, and then two or three days later everyone will forget about it and the, the premium will, rot, will widen. I think the other question is not just what pushes the AH premium to its current level, but what keeps it from collapsing. And that's mostly short selling restrictions. So even though on Stock Connect you'll notice there's a list of companies which um, are, allowed, are allowed for short sale, generally that trade, the reverse of the trade that I mentioned, where let's say buying eight shares and selling short A shares uh, other than through futures is still very, very, very restricted. And so it's really just imbalances and uh, uh, limitations still between the, uh, the two markets. Uh, so I've got an, I have another question here by Bliss. Hi Tarek, have you traded during the night night sessions? Are there good there are good opportunities there? Uh, short answer: No. I trade when market uh, when markets really daylight hours when they're open. So uh, my my daylight hours here in Asia are opening hours in Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Um, those that's when I trade real time. And then any of the overnight markets, say Baidu. Uh, and Alibaba or any of the ETFs, I submit overnight, imp overnight limit orders and they either get filled or not filled when I come in the next day. Uh, next question. I see that the names of the component stocks in MSCI Taiwan are linked to Apple suppliers. How do, I, how do you think I could use the contract in view of the recent news on, on the Apple launch? Um, unfortunately, I, I, yes, I, I could see the supply chain and looking at it that way. I really don't think trading the overall futures, I think the futures contract itself is going to be too rough of an instrument uh, to really try and trade, let's say, the overall Taiwan market um, versus Apple. Uh, I do believe, of course, Apple followers are tend, to, tend to be fairly efficient in following what they believe the supply chain is, who they believe has benefited, who, who they believe has gotten, um, gotten the orders and so forth. Uh, so. Um, there are the Apple suppliers in Taiwan, but there are also suppliers in, in mainland China. And uh, trading those, I think, would certainly involve a lot more knowledge about those names than I have. Um, thanks. All right. So that seems like the that seems like the list of questions that we have here. Uh, oh, I've got one more here. Um, next question: Are you aware whether or not Interactive Brokers is planning to give us direct access to Taiwanese stocks? I have no idea. I, I've asked. Uh, I would actually leave that question to Interactive Brokers if uh, anyone online uh, can answer that question. <laughs> uh, so far, we've but, offered the Taiwanese stock, yes. Oh, there, there is plan to give users access to, to, to direct Taiwan stock? Um, I think in the short period, it may not be offered at this time, but we will raise it to management as a see whether we can offer in the future. Well, it, that actually may also be an interesting question for SGX because I think I've heard on several occasions there was talk about an SGX Taiwan uh, Stock Connect program, fairly similar to the one that Hong Kong has with, uh, with mainland China. Uh, there's a fairly interesting uh, relationship also between Taiwan and Singapore's capital markets in that many Singaporean companies had TDRs, basically Taiwan Depository Rece Receipts, where Singaporean companies would trade in Taiwan. Um, so in a way, I think that's an interesting uh, question to pose both to Interactive Brokers as well as to SGX. From, from SGX, we actually don't have this uh, stay stock connect thing between Taiwan and Singapore right now. But you can always trade the MSCI Taiwan in, in this case to capture the Taiwan movement. Yeah, I think, uh, Celia, last time I heard about it, I saw a tweet saying that it was rumored probably about a year ago, but I haven't heard anything about it since. Yeah, that, that was then. So I think we didn't have that. Uh, it didn't come through, actually. Okay, so any okay, other is questions? Is there any other questions? Yeah. So um, either way, uh, please do, do note my contact information up on the slide. You can, of course, always visit my website, gfmasset.com, or uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Quant of Asia. Um, I'm very often uh, trying to share my views on many different outlets, including Seeking Alpha and, and places like this. And I very much like to trade ideas on, uh, on uh, how, how you best view these markets. So. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Tarek. Uh, we are happy to enjoy and enjoy your webinar here. Thank you, Tarek. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you for Germany. attending our webinar. Thank you. Bye. I'd also like to remind everyone we have been recording today's session, and if you'd like to come back and review any of the concepts that Tarek went through today, simply watch your email later on uh, for a direct link not only to today's playback, but also to the slides that were provided for today's event. I also would like to thank FGX, the Singapore Exchange, for making today's event possible, and Tarek, a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. We look forward to having you back for some additional topics. And also want to thank everyone for your participation. Um, so with that, we will conclude our webinar today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.